that at some point, Amazon's going to radically change KU because you've got too many people chasing page reads and too many people chasing a slice of pie. People like Mal are making stupid amounts of money, but they're not that many of them. Most people that put books into KU don't make that much off of it. It's nothing to do with the quality of their work because they're all great writers. It's just simply every month, a million new words come into KU. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 127 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I have an in-depth conversation with author Blaze Ward. Blaze writes science fiction in multiple universes. He also writes odd bits of high fantasy with swords and orcs. In addition, he is the editor and publisher of Boundary Shock, Quarterly Magazine, and more. I'm sure that you'll find Blaze is a veritable powerhouse of writing. You might have to sit down for this forthcoming interview when you learn just how many words this machine of a man is producing on an annual basis. Never mind that on a monthly basis, on a weekly, and on a daily basis. But first, before I get overwhelmed just thinking about it, I wanted to read through some comments from recent episodes. So the in between episode, in between the, the last two Fridays, I released episode 126, Thanks for the Inspiration and Laughs. And this was samples of songs uh, that I found funny. They're parody songs uh, about what's going on in the world today. And I do prefer to find something to laugh about. And uh, Carol commented on that episode and she said, Thank you so much for the wonderful episode, Mark. I thoroughly enjoyed the musical parodies you shared with us. They made me smile and laugh, something that we all need more of these days. Here's another one a friend shared with me that I think you'll enjoy. And Caro shared a clip to a hilarious YouTube video via Hertfordshire Alamont Life called I Will Survive, Don't Ask Me How, which is a parody of I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. Now here's just a really brief clip of that one. I want to smash my husband's face. I want to wave my kids goodbye. But I won't crumble. I won't lay down and die. Oh, no, not I. I will survive. Oh, so long as I have internet, I know I'll stay alive. I've got all this time to fill while trying to not get ill. But I'll survive. I will survive. Thank you so much, Carol, for sharing that. That was hilarious. And there'll be a link to that video in the show notes for this episode, episode 127, as well as in the comment that Carol left for episode 126. Thanks again, Carol. For episode 125, which was simplifying, streamlining, and organizing with Jenna Savage, Amy said, I enjoy the idea of shutting the door on things that take your time. Since lockdown, I've been spending so much time listening to the news that just ends up making me feel more depressed. I downloaded the Google Chrome extension called Limit, Set Limits for Distracting Sites. I can set how long I'm able to spend on sites, so all social media is just half an hour and news is thrown in as well. Makes it super helpful to reclaim my time and not stress too much from information overload. Thank you so much for sharing that, Amy. That is absolutely fantastic, and it's something that's really, really important. I know in the last episode and in just, just previously, I talked about the importance of laughing. That's how I deal with things. That's how, that's how I deal with stress. Uh, I tend to use humor a lot. But um, it's also important to be able to shut off those negative things that are flying in. Yeah, it's important to stay on top of uh, what's going on and to be informed, but there comes a time when, as Amy says, shutting the door is critical. So thank you, Amy. Thanks for sharing that. If I can find a link for that Chrome extension, although it's a Google extension, I'm sure you can Google it. Uh, I may, I'm able to include a link to that in the show notes. So thank you for that advice, Amy. 
And in episode 123, uh, Three Story Method with Jay Thorne and Zach Bohannon, I had some new comments. Vanessa said, loved this interview. My recently discovered writing hack is Aquanotes. This is a waterproof pad of paper with a pencil that you stick to the wall in your shower. I use it to storyboard scenes that come to me in the shower, write character notes, etc. No more coming up with a great plot idea, telling myself or remember it when I'm done showering, then getting sidetracked and forgetting all about it. Awesome, Vanessa. Thank you for sharing that. That was called Aqua Notes. I love that idea because, I mean, I don't just sing in the shower. I don't just sing parodies in the shower. I do actually uh, occasionally have ideas and what a, what a cool thing uh, we can do. Of course, I'm sure Liz and I will probably leave each other notes in the shower too. Like, what did you do with my shampoo? And I would say, I, I didn't use your shampoo. I don't have any hair. And then she says, well, you shampoo your beard once in a while. And then uh, anyways, I'm digressing. But thank you, Vanessa. That is awesome. Aqua notes. Great way to write when you're in the shower. And another comment on that episode, CP Hoff said, Love this podcast. My hack is go for a walk. A lot can be worked out in the fresh air. And you are so right with that. It is important to step away from the desk uh, and work on that. Actually, in a forthcoming episode, I'm glad you mentioned that forthcoming episode, I'm going to be talking to Roland Denzel. I'm actually recording this on Thursday, April 2nd, and at 9 p.m. Eastern tonight. Uh, actually, uh, this podcast may all already be in the feed when I'm doing this. I'll be doing a live chat with Roland on my YouTube channel, as well as on Facebook, and that'll be broadcast into an episode of the show. But it's about um, yeah, exercise and health for, for writers. And I love that because, uh, as CP said, the um, working stuff out in the fresh air, one of the bits of advice I remember getting from, um, uh, of course, I'm drawing a blank on his name, Dennis, Dennis Hamill, is he said, go for a walk with your character and listen to what your character has to say about the things you see. Because you'll see something in your neighborhood, but your character may see it and describe it differently. And and that's a really cool thing. So yeah, going for a walk, fantastic idea. Now, thank you for those comments on episode 123. If you're paying attention to the game at home, you'll know that uh, I was uh, asking people to leave comments and leave a hack or a way that they could use in honor of Jay and Zach. And um, Jay and Zach will be giving away a copy of their book, Three Story Method, as well as a copy of the workbook. In print, it'll be shipped to you. And there was a random drawing, so there were five people who left uh, comments on uh, that episode. And uh, so therefore, because uh, I can do the math somewhat, uh, the entrance had a one in five chance of winning, or a 20% chance of winning. So I put their names into a random draw of one to five, and the winner was... Vanessa, congratulations, Vanessa. You win the prize, courty, courtesy of the generosity of Jay and Zach. And I'll be reaching out to get contact info from you for where to have the copy sent. Uh, you can also contact me at mark at marklesley.ca to let me know where that can be shipped. So congratulations, Vanessa. Again, on occasional episodes, there'll be opportunities for you just by engaging, just by interacting. You get a chance to win a really cool prize. Now, the second prize, which is the same thing, it is a copy of Three Story Method and the workbook. This one is sponsored by the wonderful patrons of the Stark Reflections podcast. Because every time we do a drawing, all patrons to the show are automatically entered in a chance to win the prize. Don't have to do anything because you're already doing so much by supporting the show. Those who uh, subscribe or are patrons at $1 a month get a single entry. $3 a month patrons get entered in twice. And $5 a month patrons get three chances to win. And drumroll please, the patron winner is Linda Hill. Congratulations, Linda. I have already messaged you through Patreon to get your address on where to ship the books to, or you can message me again, mark at marklesley.ca. So thank you, Linda, and thanks to all of my awesome patrons for being a Patreon supporter of the Stark Reflections podcast. Patrons who support the show via patreon.com slash Stark Reflections get access to additional Patreon-only audio episodes that include reflections on other podcasts, as well as early access to forthcoming audiobook releases and other special additional content and prizes. So thanks again to all the patrons, and thank you guys for commenting on that episode. 
I am going to skip the personal update and get right into this conversation with Blaze, and I will meet you on the other side for a reflection. Blaze, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you for having me. I want to go back to just how prolific you are as a writer, because uh, I'm trying to remember, have we known each other for seven years, something like that? Something like that, maybe six. And I had no idea, I mean, when, when I met you, just how crazy busy you've been writing and producing. Well, that only happened over about the last two and a half, three years. Really? So it has been that more, more recent than that then? Well, when I started out, I had a full-time job as a database architect, and I was working about 45, 50 hours a week, okay. writing early in the morning and late at night. And I was running 400,000 words a year, which I later found out was really, really fast compared to most writers. <laughs> 400,000 words a year. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then when I retired in 2018, I was pushed my speed up to about 50,000 words a month. Okay. And then I realized that I could hit pulp speed, which is Dean Wesley Smith's old logic of a million words a year or about 84,000 words a month. And then I did that. And then I realized that 100,000 words a month was within my range. And so that's been my target for the last coming up on two years. Wait a second. That your target has been 100,000 words per month mm -hmm. consistently mm -hmm. for two years. Yep. I think either April or May of 2018 was the last month I didn't have 100,000 words. All righty. So are you using a keyboard? Are you dictating? How are you getting this done? I am beating the hell out of a HP laptop. <laughs> <laughs> I have to I have to comment on this because I know you're married to another writer who, who similarly abuses keyboards. Uh -huh. <laughs> Does she's way worse than me. She beats them to death. Oh, okay. And and you beat them in a in a more gentle way. Well, I've this machine that my old machine that I'm just transitioning off of has got about two million words written on it, maybe three. Really? Wow. Yeah. Well, last year was just a shade under 1.4 million words. Wow. Okay. So, so, so let, let's take a look at a typical day in the life of Blaze Ward. Uh, uh, what, what time are you getting up? How are you um, managing the writing? When are you doing it? Are you doing it in, in chunks here and there throughout the day? Or is it one big fell swoop? Well, so let's start with the fact that my wife and I don't live in the same house half the week. We've got six and a half acres out in the mountains southeast of Seattle. Okay. And she lives in a tiny house that's about 250 square feet in my front yard. And I'm in the main house, which is about 1,000 square feet. Monday morning, she got up and grabbed the kitty, and they went over there, and they will sleep over there until Friday night. I'll see her constantly, but she's okay. over there. So I get up during the week at about 6.30, my body just wakes up, fix myself breakfast, read the news, check anything, get logged in, and by about 8 o'clock, I start writing. Okay. And I work straight through until 11, noon, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, whatever. And my target is always about 4,000 words, and it's usually in a chunk of about... 1500 or 2000 and then a break and then another thousand or so in a break and then just keep chopping at it and about noon i'm done and get on with the rest of my day yesterday that involved putting up fence posts and starting a new fence around some aronia bushes to keep the elk at bay wow um yes yeah, because you guys are living on a, a big piece of property in the mm -hmm. in the wilds which is fantastic yeah. uh, okay so so it's basically you're you're using like a four or five hour stretch of time, right? For yep. for for the writing first thing. I mean, after you've uh, refueled yourself, probably with breakfast and coffee yep. and stuff like that. <laughs> okay, yep. and and then the rest of your day is is for other chores and, and other whatever, right? Whatever you want to do. Run into town because I'm I'm a I'm in the middle of nowhere in a little pocket in the mountains that I emerge out into civilization. I'm about 10 minutes to the Starbucks and I'm about 20 minutes to my post office. So 
when I literally, when I come in from the cold, I'm in civilization. Okay. But out here, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Wow. So you've had this routine pretty much consistently for the last few years. Yeah. Two years as of March 1st. And is this, this is just Monday through Friday or does this include the weekends? It's Monday through Saturday. And on Sunday mornings, there's a little restaurant down in Crane, which is just north of Enumclaw, Washington. And they open at eight and I'm there and I have my breakfast and then I come home and I start writing at nine and I work till noon or one o'clock. Okay. But yeah, every day the goal is 4,000 words. Okay. Last year, the target for 2019 was 20 novels. And I hit that and I was just like 6,000 words under 1.4 million. This year, I'm only planning 14 novels, but I'm planning 40 short stories. Because so, so, I've got so you said 14 novels? novels? Hmm? You said 14 novels? 14 novels. Only 14. Yeah, I realize. Only. only I know. Only 14. You deadbeat. You know, well, that's, I, that's like a book a month plus. <laughs> but compare me to people like Mal. Mal Cooper. She wrote 48 novels in 2018. Okay. Fair enough. And hers were 80 to 100,000 words a piece. I mean, she's insane. <laughs> there are people out there who make me look like a slacker. <laughs> so what, let's, let's talk about comparisonitis. Do you suffer from that? Even though, even though I look yeah. at it and go, oh, four, you know, 20 novels in 2019. I'm only going to do 14 novels plus a whole bunch of other books or, or short stories. Yeah. Um, but you, and it sounds like you're suffering from comparisonitis because you, you say, well, Mal Cooper, look at what she's doing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, she's doing great and highly successful. Lots of other people are do that. Well, I, I say these things because a lot of people still believe the old trad pub logic that, oh my God, I'm only allowed to write one novel a year and, and that's 70,000 words or 60,000 and that's it. Right. And in the old days of trad pub, that was acceptable, but I'm not limited, so oh my God, I get to get up in the morning and I get to write. It isn't I have to go write, it's oh my God, I get to go write. (laughs) I love that attitude. So, oh my God, I get to go write. I've had a couple of rough days the last few and then I woke up this morning and brain said, oh, you're back, okay, bang. And I dropped 4,000 words in about two hours. Wow, so do you you stop? Or do you, if you like, if, load out of me. Sorry, what was that? Do you stop if you hit four thousand in two hours, or do you just keep going for the next couple hours I, to see? I hit forty five hundred today, and brain said, "Okay, we're done." And I literally just stopped in the middle of a chapter because it's like, okay, I need to stop and think where I'm going next. Okay. Okay. It sounds like you listen to your body. You you listen to your mind, uh, the well-being for your writing. Are you familiar with the old, so one of my undergraduate trainings was in geography, urban geography. Okay. And there's this thing called P time and L time, personal time and linear time. Okay. Linear time is when you get up and you have to be to work at eight o'clock and you have a break at 10, 15 and you have lunch at noon and you leave at five, period. P time personal time. I wake up. I happen to wake up at 6.30 because, oh my God, I get to sleep in that late. You have to understand, for years, I woke up at four. Right. And I was at the office at five o'clock having breakfast so I could get two hours of writing in at the office before I had to go into my desk. Peak time means I write. It is a marathon and I'm figuring I've only got about 40 more years of writing in front of me. I'll be 51 this summer. My goal is to keel over dead with about 20 novels sitting in the hopper for my great grandkids to punch out every month for a few more years. (laughs) Excellent. And I know, I know we have a mutual friend, uh, Matt Buckman. So you've probably uh, taken the advice and uh, written that letter on on what your heirs can do with your books when you, uh, when you pass away. I have, but we need to update it tremendously because a lot has changed over the last two years in my life. Um, I have 
I don't have any kids of my own, but through my first wife, I inherited three stepdaughters by blood and two more stepdaughters who adopted me when Donna died. So I literally have five girls, all of whom are about my age. Hmm. Because Donna was considerably older than me. Right. I have a grandson who is a freshman at the Colorado School of Mines this semester. And he's one of the people that I'm looking to train. But as I told him a while back, if I keeled over tomorrow, he'd be, uh, well, if I keeled over today, he'd be almost 80 before my books come out of copyright. Oh, wow. Yeah, because it's death plus 70, and he's 18. Hmm. So it isn't just train your heirs. It's how to train your great-grandkids as yet unborn. <laughs> Fantastic. So let's get into some of the stuff that you're writing. So I know you have multiple science fiction series. Uh -huh. How many yeah. different series are you writing? Um, so the Jessica Keller books is nine core novels plus five shorter novels and novellas, and it completed with Petron back in December. Okay. The science officer started with eight, and they're all novellas. Um, and that was the end of what I call season one, and I'm writing season two now, and it's a different feel. The first one is a novella that bridges, and then I've got one novel done, and I'm just going to keep writing novels in that world that are self-contained. Um, the Star Dragon was a complete arc at five novels and it's done. Um, Long Shot Hypothesis is an arc of stories that completed at six, but I already know what the title and the plot for number seven are when I get back around to writing them. Um, Star Tribes is coming out in April and they're gonna drop one a month. So it's Winter Star, Seeker Star, Sept Star, Swift Star, and Morning Star. And that's a five novel arc that will complete itself with saving the galaxy kind of things. So there's not really anywhere to go after that, although I've got it open-ended enough, I could write one more on the back. <laughs> um, right now I'm working on a series called The Lazarus Alliance. I'm about halfway through book four. Book one was in a story bundle not too long ago. Ah, I've got a, it's, kind of a mystery sci-fi cop series that's very Blade Runner-esque in terms of feel and characters and such called the Hunter Bureau. I've got two of those in the can right now and I'm thinking about what number three is going to be. Okay. And then I've just got a bunch of other things out there. I wrote 20 novels last year and so that ended up spinning off six new series of which I've got at least one novel in all of them and two in some. And so what happens is when I finish the fourth Lazarus book, I'll look around and say, okay, which of these series should I write the next one in? So I've got Air Pirates of Serenica. I've got Taft <laughs> Station. I've got Scour. And these will all just slowly chunk forward. Okay. Wow. Meanwhile, I'm also writing a whole bunch of serialized short fiction, which is what the 40 this year is all about. Okay. So these are uh, what uh, ser serialized short fiction. So uh, what is it? 5,000, 10,000 words? What are we looking at? Um, somewhere between five and 15 per story. Every story is entirely self-contained. Okay. So they're not just chapters in a long novel, but they're a completely self-contained short story that leads into the next one. Okay. And so the Yasmin books, I've got seven of those and it's about 42,000 words so far. And there'll be 10 or 15, we'll finish the first story arc. And I've got five Ollie, and I've got two Pizza Farmer, and I've got et cetera. So there's something I have to ask. And, and so we talked about um, Mal Cooper, and we talked mm -hmm. about uh, other authors who were doing, uh, you know, lots of science fiction mm -hmm. and, uh, it, you know, rapid release and stuff like that. Are you publishing these exclusively to Amazon to leverage the Kindle Unlimited page reads, or are you publishing these wide? I'm wide. My logic is simply that at some point, and it's obviously not happening this year, although I would have expected different had the world turned out different. Um, but at some point, Amazon's going to radically change KU because you've got too many people chasing page reads and too many people chasing a slice of pie. 
Right. People like Mal are making stupid amounts of money. There's a bunch of other people making stupid amounts of money, but there are not that many of them. Most people that put books into KU don't make that much off of it. Okay. And it's, it's nothing to do with the quality of their work because they're all great writers. It's just simply every month, a million new words come into KU over what was there before. Right, right. And Kindle, while it's lovely, um, I seem to remember, and don't quote me on this, but somebody will complain that's listening. I seem to remember back at Nink last fall, um, the Amazon people said that KU or Kindle or whatever was currently available in 19 countries at that point and slowly expanding. Hmm. Which is lovely, but Kobo puts me in, I don't know, 75, 100 countries? 170. 100, all of them then. All of them <laughs> yeah. And it's fun to look at my sales and go, where the hell is that? And zoom the map all the way in and go, I've got a fan in Turk and Caicos. Cool. Um, Barnes and Noble, everybody was expecting them to die, but I'm expecting them to make one hell of a miraculous recovery over the second half of this year and turn into a serious competitor again by 2021. Right. Okay. Um, Apple, because there are some people that hate Amazon. Um, okay. Drafted Digital gets me into all sorts of weird little fringe places nobody's heard of yet because that's what they do. They find all these weird little places and they get me into libraries and all these things. They, as an indie writer, my problem is not the writing craft. I will stack my stories up for craft against just about anybody in terms of I can tell a good, compelling story. It might not be to your preference. It might not be to your taste, but I'm as good as anybody else. You have to find me. Hmm. If I'm in KU, those people will find me. But the problem is nobody ever comes out of KU. Lots and lots of my friends have put stuff in KU and then they try and come out later and discover that their fans don't come out with them. Right. Or buy new books that aren't in KU. And so they have to rebuild their entire career from scratch if they want to not be beholden to Amazon. It's a lovely idea and oh my God, uh, as of whatever today is, the 23rd, everybody in the world's looking at, at, at KU because Amazon's given them two months free sign up here. The first hit's always free. Let's get you hooked. Because we're all trapped in our quarantine. Hmm. But I want all my fans everywhere to be able to find my books. Hell, right. I've got my own shop on my website selling stuff that's exclusive. Right now it's about bunch of short stories that are not available anywhere else. Really? Because, yeah. Um, if I put a story up for 99 cents on Amazon, I make about 32 cents net. If I sell it directly off my website, I make about 66 cents net. Okay. So the goal there is just put up a bunch of short fiction because, oh my God, I'm writing a stupid amount of short fiction this year. And um, get people used to coming to and it's blazeward.com slash shop. Okay. And just buy stuff there directly for me. You're going to give me more money because there's no middleman. And you're also producing uh, content that uh, through your newsletter as well as uh, through Patreon, uh, is yeah. that correct? Where people have access to your work early or yeah. exclusive content? Um, on the Patreon, I started it up about a year ago, and I'm really not making a lot of money from it, mm -hmm. and I'm not pushing it all that hard, but the people who are giving me five bucks a month are getting some story or something at least a year before anybody else sees it. Wow. A year and before it's available. Wow. Yeah. Well, when I'm writing at this speed and I'm publishing one or two things a month, if I write two novels this month and I publish one... I build up a hell of a backlog. Ah, yes. So, hey, guys, this month, have a novel. <laughs> Last year, I sent out a short story that I had written just because it was an urban fantasy piece. And I don't write urban fantasy, and I'd, I'd have to write a whole bunch before I did anything with it, but I sent it off, and one of my patrons sent me back a note two days later going, great, when's this going to be a novel? <laughs> uh, so 
that inspired me. And in a slot last summer, I sat down and I turned it into a novel. And so that novel's sitting in the can right now, waiting for me to write two more so I can drop it wow. at least as a starting trilogy of a long arc series. So, so people who are binging Blaze Ward and have started a series that's not yet because of the, the schedule of, of releasing, it's kind of funny, you are looking at it going, well, well, I'm very much like traditional publishing, we gotta wait <laughs> so we can get into the cycle here. But um, so basically, so for $5 a month, which is basically, uh, I'm not good at math, $70 for the year. 60. 60, because see, I told you I can't do math. <laughs> uh, six, so $60 for the year. Um, th that means that basically um, they're getting, uh, I don't know how many novels, how many short stories, how many pieces of content that are not available for public consumption anywhere else yet. Uh, at least 12 things ranging somewhere between long short stories all the way up to novels in the last year. Wow. And nothing that they've read has come out. Um, we just last month finished this really cool cyberpunk thing. I had written a cyberpunk story called uh, The Dancer as part of Boundary Shock Quarterly. There was an a issue number four, Robots, Androids, Cyborgs, Oh My. I did a cyberpunk story. I had so much fun with a character that I wrote a sequel called Shira Biyoshi, which is a type of samurai, geisha, badass warrior. Okay. And then I was looking at that thinking, okay, I need to turn this into a novel because these two stories really are kind of the first two chapters, but I wanted to do some background work. So I wrote five more stories about other characters that I intended to put into the novel. So it's their origin stories. And so for the last several months, that's what people have been getting. And then last month when seven came out, I bundled all seven up into a full book for them. And so they've got that. Because that novel and novel series is on my arc, I want to write at some point because it's just straight up cyberpunk. Wow. So, and and you alluded to this uh, just just now, but on top of this writing that you're doing, mm -hmm. and and the and the schedule you're keeping, you're also publishing um, a science fiction magazines uh, like Boundary Shock Quarterly. What's going on there? What are you What are you doing with those magazines? So the first one is Boundary Shock Quarterly. Um, a couple of years ago, we were driving down to Oregon for the eclipse because a buddy of mine lived in the zone of totality. So we camped in his backyard. And we were talking about doing this because I've always wanted to do a magazine, but the tools were never there. And when Leah and I go on long drives, we come up with new projects. <laughs> the business for breakfast books, every time we go on a long drive, we arc out several new business books we're going to write on the craft of the business of being a writer and a publisher. Okay. And we were thinking about this one and said, okay, could we, and realized all the pieces were there. So I put together all my logic. What I was, what I did was it's a syndicate. So I invited 15 other writers and the rule is I'm going to publish four issues a year. You have to give me at least two, any two that you want. Some of them write into all four. It's royalty share from day one. I ask for a 90 day exclusive and then you get the rights back. Okay. And it's all about the discovery. And I've got themes out for two or three more years before I have to go come up with some new ones. Issue number 10, 10, 10. Yeah. 10 is coming out on April 10th. That's in the can. I'm just waiting for the, the pre-orders to get ready so I can take them live. Um, and that's just, it runs, it's discoverability. They, everybody in here has fans. And so their fans read it and they discover me, my fans read it and discover you. And we do that. And because it's a closed syndicate, I don't have to worry about who's going to be submitting. I don't have to read slush because all of my writers are good and they're going to okay. give me quality work. I think over the first 10 issues, I've rejected exactly one story because it just didn't work. Right. So we're doing that. And then, and then last summer, kind of as a lark, we realized how easy it was to do this. So somebody threw a bad joke at me and it metastasized into a new series I'm calling Blaze Ward Presents. <laughs> and it was a Venn diagram where four lobes were chemists, zoologists, uh, zoologists spies, and government agencies. 
and they all overlapped with moles. Okay. So the theme of issue one was an interpretation of moles. Your story must be about moles. Oh my God, we discovered a Mexican chocolate sauce. <laughs> Buckman wrote me a story where he sat down with the unabridged dictionary and gave me every definition of mole you could, which includes a breakwater built around a harbor. <laughs> He, his was a military romantic suspense story. Okay, sure. We did everything. It was fantasy. It was science fiction. It was historic. Um, the second one was, I like my science mad. Hmm. Uh, the third one I'm getting ready to announce in about a week. This one was funny because it started with a picture and an argument on Facebook. Young, beautiful woman dressed as a nun with a pistol in each hand and a submachine gun slung over her back. <laughs> obviously either in the middle of a firefight or about to start one. <laughs> and so we are doing Bad Habits, a Nuns with Guns anthology. <laughs> I love that. Worst, I told the people on that thread we were going to do it, but I told them I, had, I haven't announced it public yet. This, you are getting the exclusive announcement. It's not even going up on Facebook for, until the first. Yeah. <laughs> I've already gotten 85,000 words of submissions to it. <laughs> wow yeah because people knew it was coming because it's easy for me to read it i don't do a lot of heavy editing it's either going to work or it's not going to work but most people i'm working with in the syndicate are pros i'm a little more broad range of submissions on the blaze word presents but i'm also much more forgiving about what we're doing because again, it's royalty share. The cost to me is the time to read everything and edit it into shape and the cover art. Right, right. If anybody wants to do this or learn how to do this, I actually wrote a business for breakfast book called How to Start Your Own Magazine. Okay, cool. It's number eight in the series, I think, or number nine. It has the contracts that I gave everybody. It's got the pitch document that I gave everybody. It's got a real time as I'm doing it. I wrote a chapter. Okay, now it's March. Here's what I've just done. Now it's June. Here's what I've just done. As I put it together and put the first issues out. Anybody wow. can do it. That's the fun part. Wow. So I'm thinking about people listening to this mm -hmm. and looking at all of the things you're doing, obviously, I mean, you said you retired from, and, and you're young, so you retired mm -hmm. from um, the, the day job to mm -hmm. write full-time 2018. And you did mention that prior to leaving, you would get up at four in the morning so you could put in two hours of writing uh, during the workday. How long mm -hmm. were you doing that before you decided you were at a place where you wanted to leave the job and, and start writing full-time? So 2013, in one of those lightning strikes of awesomeness, I ran back into Leah after I had not seen her for several years. Okay. And we started dating again, and she knew before I did, but we were engaged in nine weeks. <laughs> and she convinced me in the fall of 2013 that I could write. I could write genre fiction. I could be successful at it. I've always been a writer, but I've got piles and piles of stuff on old hard drives and, and stored that nobody's ever seen. Right. But I started writing in the end of 2013. I got serious and started writing novels at the end of 2014. And at that point, I realized I want to do this. So that's when. I lived, it was 42 miles from my door to my office. So I would get up at four, I'm out the door by 4.25, I'm at the office at five o'clock when the garage door opens, just so I could write. I did that from probably the middle of 2015 until the beginning of 2018. So I did that for several years. And then I was lucky enough to be in a position because she sold her house in downtown Seattle. We closed the mortgage out here on the farm, put a lot of money in the bank, and were able to just write. But again, that was luck more than anything. Okay. But 
I also made not as much money as I was making as a database architect last year. Okay. But I was above median income. Cool. Last year. And awesome. I don't have to go to work. I don't have to put on pants. I don't have any of that crap. So I'm way happier. Oh, that's fantastic. And and the thing is, is and you're continuing to produce. So mm-hmm. not only are all of the assets that you already have available out there and earning, but you've got new material coming uh, that's going to continue to just grow that income. Yep. I'm going to keep dropping at least one novel every month. Although at some point I'm going to have to start dropping more than one just because I've got such a backlog. Right. I'm going to drop at least six magazines a year for Boundary Shock and Two Blaze Word Presents. Um, I'm working on another secret project that I can't tell anybody about where I'm going to edit a anthology this summer. All the stories are just starting to trickle in right now. And we'll announce that later because it's a closed invite project. Right. Um, yeah. We just, I, I, I get to get up in the morning and I get to tell stories for a living. I get to make shit up and people pay me. <laughs> I love that. that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm also considering... Uh, somebody who's just got their first book out or just finishing and getting ready to publish it. And then they go, wait a second, dude has how many books? Uh, And how many more is he writing every year? I I don't want them to suffer from comparison itis, but I'd love to hear some advice from you because you, you remember what that was like. And what was the deciding element or factor or um, the thing that you learned that helped you with, with the mindset and maybe the, uh, the conviction to just do it and get it and get this work done. So let me take that a little sideways and share an interesting thought with you. Okay. Um, down in Enumclaw, Washington, there is a bookstore called the sequel and the owners are buddies of mine. And I left Mike and Susan a stack of business cards. And whenever somebody walks in and there's a bunch of writers around here who have just finished their first novel or, they want to do something. And he says, here, reach out to Blaze. And so I occasionally get emails from people going, hey, I finished this first novel. I don't know what to do. Okay, well, here. What I have discovered is that as a young writer, if you're not an asshole, all the old writers will happily sit down and answer questions. You might have to buy them beer, possibly dinner, but they'll let you pick their brains. Hmm. And that's what I do with people. That's, that's my way of paying back. I have two young ladies, young ladies, uh, one of them's my age and one of them's 10 years older, but they've just completed their first and second books. And so I'm working with them. I'm, we were talking about all the things I do. In addition to Patreon, I've got two newsletters that I'm doing now. My regular Blaze Word newsletter comes out on the 1st and the 15th where the 15th is the publication newsletter that talks about whatever just came out and whatever's coming up next. Okay. And the one on the first we call the anti-stodgy redneck chef edition. <laughs> because my wife has read studies that say most people lock in their tastes on everything between the age of 14 and 25. Okay. You eat the same food, you listen to the same music, you wear the same clothes, you read the same books, whatever. You are locked in at 24, 25, and it never, ever changes. Oh, my God, no. So every month we try and do something anti-stodgy, a new (laughs) recipe, a new music. I used to walk into Half Price Bookstore and randomly pick out a CD and buy it to listen to (laughs) just because, hey, this looks interesting. The weirdest, most successful one I've had so re- recently was the first album by a band called We Were Promised Jetpacks. <laughs> it's weird, and I would have never encountered it except it was used and I bought it. And so every month I try and do something anti stodgy, and I talk about it in the first half of the newsletter. Uh, you and I were talking offline beforehand. I've transitioned out of Windows onto a Linux laptop, and instead of Microsoft Word, I'm writing in LibreOffice these days. And so that's been an adventure for me. And then the second half of that newsletter is a recipe because my wife has all sorts of food allergies. So I have to work around the fact that she is allergic to all grains, corn, (laughs) wheat, soy, oats, barley. She's allergic to cow's milk and she's allergic to eggs. 
Hmm. So our general diet is dead critter and fresh veggies, but I've had to come up with all sorts of recipes for things. So, hey, guys, here, have a recipe. <laughs> Make yourself anti-stodgy. Think new thoughts so that you don't get trapped in the same rut. For me, writing, that's why I have so many different series, because I don't want to write the same characters forever and ever and ever. I'll get bored. But, hey, let's go do this. This looks like fun. So that's my personal newsletter. And then I've started up, and this circles a long way back, the Milestone Publishers newsletter, where we are dedicating it to all things indie and all things future. So what's happening in indie publishing right now? I don't care about New York and TradPub because that doesn't work for me and it doesn't compete with me, but what are the new tools coming out? What are the new techniques coming out? Um, I'm writing, so the one that's coming out in a week, the next newsletter is all about what we call the back half of the value chain. You've written the, the novel, it's done, it's been copy edited, now what the hell do you do? Hmm. So the newsletter is gonna turn into a business book at some point, but I'm writing down, okay, here are the steps as I think you need to do, and I've sent it to Matt Buckman and I've sent it to Lee and said, what, what did I miss? And they both had things to add. And so everybody gets this, and this is for new writers, here's what you need to do. Here are the pieces that, that nobody else has spelled out for you. And so understand metadata, understand what cover art, understand how to understand your genre so that you can figure out how to write your blurbs and what cover art and, 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 and. Hmm. So that a new writer coming along gets a hell of a head start. Because you and I've had to just wade through crap to figure all this out over the years. <laughs> for sure. So where can and, people sign up for this particular newsletter? Because I know they're, they're um, listening to this and going, It's Ooh. on my website. Okay. www.blazeward.com slash newsletters, obviously. There's two signups there. The top one is the personal one. The bottom one is for Milestone. And it actually says Milestone there. Um, next month, April, no, May. Uh, Buckman, Matt Buckman has written for me a 101 on marketing because he just recently launched a new thriller series. The first book was called Drone and he did all sorts of old school witch's hat marketing designed to get a hell of a spike on day one. And it was his birthday. He was number one in thriller and number 43 on Amazon paid with Drone. Yeah, so it's like, Matt, write me up some stuff on marketing for everybody because they need to know these things. <laughs> because he's obviously doing something right. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to learn a lot from it. Everybody else is going to learn a lot from it. That's how we help the new writers coming along. Um, some of the times I'll actually do... One of the other writers I'm working with, I am consulting. I am not her publisher, but I am acting as though I were publishing her. Mm -hmm. So she says, what do I do here? Oh, you should go look up these things. And I give her homework. And she goes and she looks them up and she realizes, okay, and da, da, da. And eventually she'll be able to start her own publishing company, which is what she wants to do. Hmm. And then she'll be able to do it. But she's a nice lady. And she asked really nicely, hey, I need help. What can, what can I do? Yeah. Oh, well, here, try these things. <laughs> wow. You've sat at that table, same as I have. The old farts sit around and talk, and you ask a real simple question, and nobody jumps down your throat. Somebody turns and says, oh, I did something like this. Try this. And three other people pop in. Oh, here's another idea. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. <laughs> you take notes. It's a fire hose, but it's a really useful fire hose. We do a monthly writer's lunch out here in Seattle and do people that come along, they get the fire hose. But <laughs> for months it all makes sense and now they can know what to do and what questions to ask. And so they turn into successful writer publishers themselves. And that's fantastic. That's fantastic. And so uh, I know um, when I was talking to Leah earlier uh, this year, uh, she was talking about the fact that you guys have decided when and where you're going to uh, make time to go be with other writers at different conferences. I think I, I, the last time I saw you guys uh, was at Novelist Inc., I believe, in person. Yeah, yeah um, it was an Inc. last fall. Um, we have since then, and I, I don't remember exactly when you talked to her, but 
the world fell out from underneath everybody. A little bit, yeah. I don't know what your sales did, but between you and me and everybody listening, my sales basically units dropped about half, income dropped about a quarter just over the last two months. Right. It's just been a shit show. I haven't looked today. I've been sitting in the yuck, yuck, yuck stage, but every once in a while I'll get a good number. Hmm. So what we have done is simply looked around and said, okay, not spend any money this year. So right. we are not doing any more audio books this year until sales turn around. Um, I'm in the process of getting my science officer books translated into German and we've held off on doing number three, even though one and two are selling pretty well. Hmm. Yeah. We, we're probably not going to Nink this year because for the two of us to go to Nink for a week is about 3000 bucks. Right. I'm not sure I can justify that. Not right now. Because, yeah, well, it's everybody staying home, but everybody's giving their books away for free. I've cut my prices on a whole bunch of things. I will, I will not generally give books away free as part of a teaser. If somebody reaches out to me and say, hey, I'd really like to read your stuff. Which one would you recommend? Bang, here, have a download link. It doesn't cost me anything, and I get you hooked on book one. Any right. of your readers want to read Oberon or the science officer, send me an email. I'll send you a link. <laughs> well, why don't you tell us your email so they can easily reach out to you? Um, hit blazeword.com and contact. That's Perfect. the best way to reach. Oh, me. there's a, they can easily just uh, email you from there. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. There's a contact me right there on the page. Um, but what I've discovered is if you give books away for free, it doesn't really convert over very often because a lot of people just obsessively collect the book, but because they haven't given you any money for it, they don't really put any value on it. Right. Someone reaching out and sending me an email, that's that's time and effort on their part. That's a commitment. Yeah, they're they're, they're actually money. invested in it, right? Mhm. Mm yep. So, Excellent. and I've got so many books out there that I don't care. Here, have a book one for free. That series has eight more books in it. I'll make up for it if you decide you like them all. Right. Same with piracy. People pirate me, I don't really care. Because if most people are fundamentally honest and they might pirate the book because they're in a place right now where they can't afford books and they find me on a pirate site and they read me, a lot of them will come back later and say, you know, I did this, I'm buying all your books now. Right. Or they find me in a library and oh my God, this was so great. I had to go buy it because I wanted my own personal copy. Great. People <laughs> are fundamentally honest. Neil Gaiman actually talks about this a lot. Um, Places where his books weren't available were getting pirated translations. And then people were going back and buying all of his other books once they had read him. Hmm. So for him, it was just marketing budget. And I look at it the same way. Excellent. I like that attitude. I can stand up against any writer out there. If you like science fiction that is character driven and really interesting humans who are forced to go beyond themselves. I don't write chosen one stories and I don't really write God stories. These are just normal people who woke up one morning in the wrong place. You walked into a bar on the wrong day and all hell broke loose and everything goes from there. Hmm. But you won't be able to put it down. <laughs> My brother-in-law complains because more than once he sat down and said, I'll just read one more chapter and then it's two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That's a great problem to have. It is, especially when it's my brother-in-law bitching at me. <laughs> I know I've done something good then. Yeah. Well, Blaze, I want to thank you so much for uh, taking the time to hang out with me and share some advice and all kinds of uh, amazing strategies that you're using for publishing. Hey, throw wet spaghetti at a drywall and see what sticks. That's my advice for all writers. What works for me might not work for you. What works for you might not work for me. Neither of us are wrong. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, my friend. Yeah. Anytime you want me on or anything, let me know. And any of your fans want to reach out to me, it's blazeward.com. So there's two things I want to reflect on with the conversation with Blaze. The first is stop the comparisonitis. I'm doing it right now. You're probably doing it right now. Come on. Be better to yourself. Do not compare yourself to what other writers are doing. Compare yourself 
to what you did before and how you're getting better. The second thing I want to focus on is discipline. This is really, really important. Yes, Blaze is getting a lot of work done, but he's getting a lot of work done because he has put butt in chair and pounding and vigorously, viciously beating the crap out of his keyboard. But he is getting those words down. He talked about while he was working, he would get up at four o'clock. He would get into work early so he could have breakfast when he was there and then get two hours of writing done before working a full day of work. Sure, he moved on to become a full-time writer, didn't change much other than he gave himself four hours minimum to write in a day with uh, the mornings again for the time to get those words in before he does the other things that need to get done. What I think is consistent in that, whether he's uh, doing work or whether he's doing personal stuff, is he set a schedule and he stuck to it. And the other thing that I think that's important, because and maybe it resonates with me, because I tend to get my most creative stuff done early in the morning. And it's also before, you know, I open up uh, social media and start looking at Facebook and all the other things that distract me and take me away from what I need to get done. If I actually get those words done first before I do anything else, I tend to be most productive. So he just obviously extends that. When it was a work day, it was it was sometime in the morning. And then uh, now it's it's longer, you know, it's till noon or or one o'clock. And and again, he allows himself to sleep in. Uh, For him, that's sleeping in uh, as well. So that's really, really important. So again, it's not necessarily about whether or not you're able to do it full time. It's about the discipline. It's about the prioritization. For me, I have to put it on my calendar. I have to specifically write down, uh, whether it's digitally or on paper, what I plan on getting done, and then not allowing myself to do the other things until I have gotten those words done. And discipline is that other reflection. Well, that's it for episode 127 of the Stark Reflections podcast. Again, this is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If you like the podcast and you found it helpful or useful, the best way you can help me is to leave a review on the podcatcher of your choice or share it with a friend that you think would find value in the podcast. Thanks again for joining me in this episode. I will be chatting with you again next week in episode 128. So until next Friday and episode 128, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.